Now, for those that weren't here yesterday, I'll just invite Costa on the stage and ask him just a few questions so that we may get to know him even a little bit better. Now, I met him yesterday, and the first thing I noticed was like, oh, okay. Me and him are very similar already. We both don't have hair, and we, we're both good looking, right? <laughs> so that was one similarity straight away. And then I, I spoke to him a little bit, and he told me that um, his, his wife is of African heritage as well. So just like me. So two similarities already straight <laughs> off the bat. So that was pretty good. But Costa, I'll just ask you to briefly tell us a bit about yourself and how you became so passionate about evangelism. Um, okay, without giving away the sermon today, um, my, my passion for evangelism comes from the fact that I was given something that I really didn't deserve. And I feel it's a duty and imperative for me to share what I've experienced in my life. If you truly knew who I was, I'm not sure you would have me up here. You'd probably call a board meeting, actually. But the difference is that God saw some value in me that even I could not see. And I want to share the value that each and every person has for God. He calls us the apple of his eye. And I think we're allowing other people to validate us instead of letting God in and showing us who we truly are. And that's what I want to share in my work. All right, thank you very much. Um, which, what would you say was your favorite verse and what does it mean to you in your life? Okay, we had that one yesterday, but I'm going to go with that again, okay? Hosea chapter uh, 11, verse 8. In fact, if you read the whole of Hosea, it's very much about how God's people had um, strayed away from him and God was going to destroy them and God was going to make them like Egypt and God was going to do all these terrible things. But when it came down to God actually getting rid of the people, he says in chapter 11 verse 8, but how can I get rid of you? How can I destroy you? I love you too much. And he turns. God repents from what he was going to do. He changes his heart. He changes his mind and he allows him to live on. And that was my baptismal verse. And I love that verse. It just, it just shows me that even though I may stray, even though I may slip away, God will never give up on me. And I love that about God. All right. Thank you very much. Now, on a lighter note, what is a typical Sunday like in the Vegas household? And what is your favorite family activity? Um, a Sunday. Um, at the moment, it's me trying to finish my dissertation and my daughter running into my study every minute trying to watch Mother Goose Club. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's active. We have two, two uh, young, young girls um, in our household who keep me on my toes. I love spending time with them. I love spending time with my family. Um, I, I just love playing with my kids a lot, you know, um, teasing my wife and giving her a hard time. But then she does the same to me, so it's all good. Okay. Uh, and lastly... If your life was a movie, what genre would it be and why? It would be a dra-ha-rom-com. <laughs> it would be drama because my whole life seems to have drama in it. It would be a horror movie because of some of the stuff that's going on. It would be a romantic um, comedy because, you know, again, just God just keeps loving me, loving me, loving me. And I just love to laugh, so <laughs> it's a bit of a comedy as well. I, I, I try not to take life too seriously. All right, thank you very much. Okay. I'll leave you to it. All right, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure how to start a sermon after that, to be honest with you. But um, I, I tell you what, let's pray. That's a good place to start. Father, we want to thank you so much for who you are. And Lord, let this be entirely about you. If we've ever made it anything other than about you, then forgive us. Help us, Lord, that we may focus on the message today. Lord, you spoke to us in a powerful way last night. 
You taught us how to love you. You taught us how to recognize who we are as individuals. Help us, Lord, today to recognize that without unity there can be no evangelism. And the theme for this weekend, evangelism, should not be a waste of our time. It should not be another expedient message in formalism and traditionalism. But help us, Lord, to seek you in a new and powerful way, Lord. May nothing that is said today be from a sinful man, but may the message be profound through the power of the Holy Spirit. May it fall upon open hearts, open minds, and open ears, Lord. For your word will never return to you void. So even if one person is changed today, Lord, I say hallelujah. I say bless the Lord. O oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name, for we ask these things. Through the powerful name of Jesus, let the church of God say amen. It's really good to see the church full today. Um, saw lots of um, white, cream, pleather, leather seats yesterday. And I can't see so many today. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, if you weren't here last night, I think you really missed out on a powerful, powerful time that we had together with the Lord. Um, but we welcome you. This weekend is um, about evangelism. Last night we talked about commitment and intimacy with the Lord because you can't evangelize on your own power. You can't evangelize on your own strength. It has to be through the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit. But until you are intimate with God, you cannot know God's desire for you. He says, I know the plans I have for you. But the struggle is that we don't seem to know the plan that God has for us. And that's a shame because we ought to know intimately the voice of God. For where he says in Psalms 46 verse 10, be still and know that I am God. The word know is taken directly from the language used in the book of Genesis where it says that the man shall know his wife. It's a, an intimacy that goes beyond that sexual intimacy of a man and a woman. It is profound. It is that which gives you the peace that passes all understanding. It is that which gives you the assur assuredness, assurity that you are safe. You are saved in God's kingdom. It is that peace that comes only by submission to God. Have I not turned it on? Secondly, secondly, what we learned last night is that where God says, I know the plans that I have for your church, who is God speaking to in your church? Is God speaking through the pastor, the pastor alone? Is God speaking through the elders, the elders alone? And this is important for when we come back this afternoon, I believe at 3 o'clock, I want us to examine something that maybe we haven't considered before something called servant evangelism. And I want you to understand that you cannot evangelize, truly evangelize, until you become somebody's friend. And each and every one of us is a minister. I'm not a minister. Yes, you are a minister. God says you are a minister. But I can't... And all the excuses come out. I don't know if you know this. Did you know that a smile is a ministry? Did you know that taking somebody home for lunch is ministry? Do you know that just chatting to somebody at a bus stand sometimes is ministry? But there are other ways to minister. And we're going to be talking about death watch evangelism. We're going to be talking about Pictionary ministry. We're going to be talking about all sorts of wonderful things. And tomorrow, just to wrap everything up, we're going to, we're going to share a message with you called, But the Laborers Are Few. God's house is full but his fields are empty. And he says, who will go and work for me today? I want you to know that not only does God empower you, he makes you brilliant. He makes you awesome. He makes you fantastic. And, and, and this was brought out in the welcome last night. And because there are more people here, I, I just want to share that welcome with you. Because I want you to understand that if God has touched you, God has created you to do 
beautiful things. God has given you so much power. We talked about this last night. There is power in the Word of God. And when God speaks for you, nobody can stand against you. Every weapon that is formed against you shall not prosper. And I want you to believe that you are wonderful in God's sight. The Bible says that you are wonderfully created. I want you just now, just, just because I want us just to get this. Just turn to the person next to you. I don't care if it's man and man and woman and woman. Just turn to the person next to you and say, if God has touched you, you've got the right stuff, baby. Aha. Uh-huh. Just do that for me. <laughs> you've got the right stuff, baby. Aha. Uh-huh. entitled unity is not an option unity is not an option I'm not saying it's not an option as in it should not be considered what I'm saying is it's not optional you cannot evangelize without unity that is not to say that you cannot evangelize or you cannot evangelize the church cannot evangelize without unity Jesus said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's all the way. It's all the way. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah? I want to share a little story with you. It's called Everybody, Somebody, Anybody, and Nobody. Some of you may have heard this story. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. (laughs) Our scripture verse today comes to us from the book of Psalms, chapter 133 and verse 1. Psalms 133 and verse 1. Is it okay if I take off my jacket? Yeah, it's a little bit warm up here. I know this is your autumn, but to me this is summer. (laughs) Psalms 133 and verse 1. The Bible declares this. Behold how good... And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I'll read that again. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The great preacher of the late 1800s, Charles Spurgeon, said that where love reigns, God reigns. Where God reigns, love flows freely without obstacles. And where it is allowed to flow freely, unity is an ever-present resident, not a temporary guest. In the time that we spend here today, we need to recognize that unity is not optional. It is an imperative for the church. And I'm going I'm to give you four reasons why unity is something that is required in order for a church to function well. Reason number one. Unity is not optional because it is good for us personally. How many of you like stress? How many of you, how many, you like stress? How many of you, how many of you like um, to be, um, how can I put this? How many of you like trouble? How many of you are troublemakers? Are you two sitting next to each other because you know each other? Okay, but you're both, you're only two people that put their hands up. (laughs) But you're honest about that. You like trouble. You like to cause trouble. Sometimes. (laughs) Nobody else here likes to cause trouble. (laughs) So, who who is she? She, His, his. Okay. Brother, I have a scripture for you from the wise man Solomon. He said, (laughs) it is better for a man to sleep on the roof of his house than to sleep in the same room as a quarrelsome wife. Amen? But I I got the feeling. 
<coughs> I got the feeling you're sleeping on the sofa tonight, though. <laughs> I don't like trouble. I mean, stress is a good thing because it warns you of danger. But who on earth likes thinking, thinking? Who likes to quarrel all the time? Some people do. Who likes to be talked about? But I don't like unnecessary stress. I like to live a nice, easy life. Amen? I, 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 like, I, like, I like to get on with folk. I don't like it when people cook me for dinner at lunchtime and, you know, they badmouth me. But you know what? It happens nonetheless. But I, I tend to try and limit the stress in my life. Let, let, let's try and catch up with this. It's good for you personally. Um, I don't like power struggles. I don't like bitterness. I don't like grudges. I don't like any other needless thought patterns. And if we would allow God to open our eyes and show us the untouched possibilities uh, uh, by being true Christians, by being the church that God wants us to be, uh, I, I don't like coming to church and, and folk don't talk to me because of something that I did 10 years ago that I wasn't aware of. Maybe I sat in somebody's seat. Maybe, maybe I said something or maybe I preached without a tie and somebody didn't like that. But, but, but the Bible wants us to be perfectly clear that even though we have differences, even though we don't dance to the same beat, we are moving in the same direction. And God wants us to, to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace, which is the bond of peace. Uh, I want us to get today that, that, that beyond everything else, we have to put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I would have hoped somebody would have said amen to, to us putting on love. I, I'm pleading with us today to refuse to be concerned and controlled by the ingredients of factions and elements that hinder unity. Now, remember what I said last night. I am not talking about North Perth Church. I'm talking about other churches because none of these things happen here. Amen. I've seen many people in life overwhelmed with stress, anxiety, and symptoms of uncertainty. And so my first simple piece of advice is to simplify your life and prioritize that which is important. And what better way to simplify and prioritize than to do so by eliminating divisive elements. Paul says that we ought to learn to be at peace with ourselves, with, with others, and with God to live a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Unity matters, church, uh, because it is good for us personally. That's the first one. Secondly, unity matters because it is good for the body of Christ. Did you know that God actually commands the blessing of unity? Some things in life are optional, but unity is not one of them. Uh, to divide, to control, to manipulate, and to be a source of disunity is direct disobedience, rebellion, and it is the evidence of the spirit of Antichrist. Disunity is a sin, and God hates division amongst his own people. You, you, may, you may know of the story in, in the book of Numbers chapter 16. Moses was trying to take uh, the, the, the people of God to the promised land. And it's a tough time when you're in transition. It's a tough time because nobody likes change. Who likes change? Three people. Did you hear the joke? How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Who said anything about change? Nothing wrong with a light bulb. <laughs> God's, God's people are moving away from, 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 from Egypt and all of the wonderful things that they enjoyed about Egypt. They must have liked Egypt. Because they were on their way to the promised land, but everything was miserable. Everybody was complaining. And there's a quotation from Ellen White that says that they preferred the, the flesh pots of Egypt than to freedom. And some of us like the old things, amen? Just say amen if you like the old things. And so what happens now is some of the people start to complain 
about Moses and one of these guys is Korah. And the Bible says that, that, that Korah gathered all of his followers in opposition to them at the entrance of the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord appeared to the entire assembly. Korah and his followers became a source of strong dissension for the rest of the two million Hebrew people. Let me tell you something, my friends. It only takes one. It only takes a couple to destroy a whole church. If you allow it to, one bad apple would destroy the whole bunch. But let me tell you something. God is not going to stand by idly and watch his church being ripped apart. God may do for some of us what he does for Korah. He gives Korah and his crew a considerable amount of time to get right. However, like some of us, perhaps they thought that God's patience was a sign of feebleness. But my friend, don't ever make the, the mistake of confusing Jesus' meekness for weakness. God will be very, very gentle. God will be patient. God will be slow to anger. Uh, he cajoles us. He harasses us. It comes to a point, though, when God says enough is enough. And Korah is causing disunity in the nation of Israel, casting aspersions upon the leadership of Moses. And it's time for God to act on behalf of Moses, behalf of the people, their future, and even God's own name. And the Lord says to Moses and to Aaron, separate yourselves from this assembly so that I can put an end to them at once. God says to Moses and his faithful servants to get away from Korah. Get away from the tents. Get away from the device who follows because I'm going to take care of this problem. I know we don't like to hear sermons about an angry God. We want to know this loving God, this, this, this lamb. But there comes a time when God has to stand up. And take care of business. Cliff, could you just get me some water, please? Thank you. God says, get away from the troublemakers. Please note that there are people, these are people who are in the camp of Israel. These are church folk. They're in the camp of God. These are the people that Jesus speaks of in 2 Timothy uh, chapter, two, chapter 3, verse 5, when he says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, have nothing to do with them. And it did not matter how much God warned them. Sometimes we just will not listen. And the Bible says that as soon as he finished saying all of this, the ground under them split apart, the earth opened its mouth, swallowed them, and they went down alive into the grave. They perished. It was as though they were never even there. God hates disunity. The church of God should be a place of love. It should be a place of fellowship. It should be a place where we are able to go and find sweet solace. But as I said, not North Perth Church. There's nothing but love here. God hates this unity. It causes pain. It causes misery, it causes distress, it breaks hearts and loves and lives. If there is no unity, people cannot grow together. If there's no unity, people cannot walk in the same direction. If there's no unity, then the cause of God is defeated, not by Satan, but by the very people that God is trying to use to bring to an end to the very misery that we face each and every day. Unity does not mean that we exactly think alike, but it does mean that we get along. It does mean that we talk in the halls, we stay connected, we, we love each other, we phone each other, we feed each other, we give each other money when we need it. We love each other with the love of Christ and become a people of trust and integrity. Unity is not an option because it is good for the body of Christ. Number three, unity is not an option because it's good to those outside of the church. God has strategically placed this church, how long has this church been here? 12 years? 12 years? 12 years ago, God placed this church here for a specific reason. Amen? It could have been somewhere else, but God said here. Why here? And God has a strategy in everything that he does. He has a plan. You are part of the desire of ages. It was not an accident that this building was erected here. 
I don't know if this building was here before, if it was built, but whatever the reason was, God had a hand in this. There was something intuitive about what God does, and there are so many in our community around us who are broken. I passed by the part where you guys, what is it called, manna? You know, and, and, and there's pain in that part. There's addiction in that part. There's brokenness in that part. And I love that you guys go there. That's fantastic. But I'm trying to show you that, 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 that there is a reason why we are here. There's a reason why we are in this community. There's a reason why we're in this neighborhood. There's depression around us. There's loneliness around us. There are those who need refreshing and a spiritual encounter with God. There are people around us that, that, that you know, I tried to do some, some research last night on, on this area, but unfortunately the page wouldn't open up in, in, in my browser. But, but you know, I, I got the sense that there was, there was burglary and robbery, but, but not just burglary and robbery of the house, but also burglary and robbery of people's mind, people's heart. Adultery is going through the roof. Domestic violence is, is going crazy, and I'm talking about in the church and outside the church. And so I say, how can I face tomorrow? I can because there's North Perth Church. There's a church over in my neighborhood that I can go to. There's a place where I can go and find fellowship. There's a place where I can go and find a warm welcome. And, and, and you know, from what I hear, you guys are, get on really, really well. The older folk and the younger folk, the conservative and the liberal, you guys get on really well. You're very tolerant. You're a very welcoming church. And I love that about you. That's the purpose of the church. And the purpose of the church is that it is good for the community at large. You're not here as a club. This is not Boy Scouts or Girl Guides. You're here for a serious purpose. You have a divine mandate as a church. You are ordained to carry forward God's gold. It doesn't matter what injuries you have along the way. You just pick yourself up and you keep going. But, but I want you to know that the church was not here by accident. Don't just walk in here and, and, and just nonchalantly think, well, I'm just going to understand what your purpose is. God says, I know the plans I have. For North Perth Church, families are being attacked from every angle in our society. Jobs are difficult to maintain, daily stresses, teenagers struggling in the internet age, and, and, and there's pornography attacking us all over the place. Where would I go that is better than the house of God? The song says, where could I go but to the Lord? Surely people come to church, come to church, divine, deserve to find love and togetherness and unity. And I've seen many people battered by life. I know people who are prostitutes, alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, and trust me, I know them because I was there. And I've seen them struggle through life. I've seen them uh, uh, de make decisions for God. I've seen them go to the campaigns. I've seen them come to tent meetings. I've seen them in, in, in the conventions that we have. And they, they, they make a change for their lives. And they put away all of the old things. But guess what happens? The things that the world could not do to them, the world could not finish them off. They come to church where they expect to find some love. And then the church finishes them off. Not North Perth. Other churches. They've given up alcohol. They've given up drugs. They've given up um, loose living. They've given up all sorts of things. And, and, and they come to church and we're on them. Your skirt's too short. Really? I'm not sure why we invited this guy. <laughs> Your trousers are too tight. Really? At least they have trousers on. <laughs> I, is anybody hearing me? You know, you know you've got to stop eating pepper. Really? Don't you know that God can save them? And he may have to save them from you. And if you cannot pray for them, pray for yourselves. If you cannot help them, if you do not have a kind word for them, leave them alone. Because you're going to break their heart. 
You're going to do to them what the world failed to do to them. You might be the thing that finishes them off. And I remember I, remember I had a flatmate and I studied. Um, I had a Bible study every Thursday. I mean, she didn't want to know nothing about God. Domestic abuse was going on in her life. She had no self-esteem. She kept going back to the guy because he loves me. And she was into drugs. She was into alcohol. But, but the, her bedroom was next to um, the room where I had Thursday night Bible study. And, and one evening she came in after the studies, after about a year, she came in and, and said, Costa, I've been listening to you. You know, she would turn off her reggae music, bless her, you know, so that we could have our Bible study. But she was listening, praise God. She was listening. And she came in on the Thursday evening after the last study, and she said, Costa, I've been listening to your studies, and I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to the Lord. That was 21 years ago. And she started coming to church. But remember where she was coming from. And she wasn't working. She had no money. And the money she had, she would go out and she would spend her money on, on drink and, 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 and drugs and whatever. But she came to church as she was. You know, we sing the song, Just As I Am. Yeah? Jesus says, come as you are. So she came as she was with her short skirt. God help her. And I introduced her to the pastor. I said, Pastor, you know, we've done all of the fundamental beliefs. She, she, she wants to give her life to the Lord. And <laughs> pastor said, well, that's good. I'll convene a meeting with the elders. Really? And, and I was not allowed to go into this meeting with her. This is her first experience of church. Six men and her. And they said to her, we will not baptize you because your dress is inappropriate. I'm not talking about North Church, other churches. 21, 22 years ago, she has never stepped back into church. And she vows not to. I could tell you so many examples like this. But if people come to church, understand that God sent them to you. And you are responsible for them. Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is God's desire to entrust us with many visitors. Those who are spiritually thirsty. Those who are hurting souls. But how can God trust us with much if he cannot trust us with little? God is looking for people who will seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And then all of the other things will be added unto us. But guess what, my brothers and my sisters? If no ships go out, no ships come in. If you're not hungry, if you're not thirsty, if you're not seeking God's kingdom, why would you ever evangelize? We're comfortable, aren't we? We have nice chairs here. We have a beautiful building. We get some revenue. We rent this out to other churches. Amen. Life is good. Look at our audiovisual department. Tech top. But what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Let me break it down, church. We're the open Bible for those trying to find direction in their lives. And our reputation is everything. No unity, no growth. Are you growing? No unity, no attractive qualities. Are you attractive? Church growth really isn't that hard, but unity is a must. Do you know why Jesus said, I wish that you were hot or that you were cold? Any idea? Anybody? And, and I find this fascinating. I find this fascinating. Jesus says, I wish that you were cold. Hot or cold? But because you're lukewarm, not North Perth Church, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But why does it say I wish that you were cold? If you're cold, you know where you are. Amen. I hate God. I hate church. Amen. If you're hot, beautiful. You're on fire. Amen. You're doing follow him. You're doing uh, uh, manna. You're doing all sorts of stuff. Amen. That's wonderful. But the lukewarm... And the problem with lukewarmness, and there are many problems with lukewarmness, but the main issue that I'm trying to address today is that when you're lukewarm, you have just about enough of an, an, an illusion of Christianity. But when you're going out there and your friends see you and your friends are trying to find Christ and they see you pretending, 
When our children are leaving the church because we tell them one thing, but we do an entirely opposite thing when we go home. Because nobody sees what goes on behind closed doors except for your kids. And your kids hate the Lord because they see how you behave towards each other. Not, not here. Other places, other cities, never here. Unity matters because it is good for those outside the church. And finally, unity is not an option because it is good for the Lord. It means a lot to God for unity to be an ever-present resident in his house. And let me tell you something. God has never smiled upon dissension. God has never smiled upon power struggles in church. You nominating committees? Sometimes God despairs. We can't vote that person in. Why not? I don't know. He talks too much. He preaches too long. He shouts a lot. Do you know that you're not appointing people of your own volition, that God is directing you as to who to nominate? But we seem to have our own little thing going on, our own little clubs. Oh, well, let's vote so-and-so in. You know, they're very wealthy. They could contribute to this program. They're educated. But we don't use people's talents and skills in the way that God wants them to be used. And, and, and we're, really, we're really arrogant with this. You know, we say that Satan can't divide. Satan can't divide your church, can he? Can he? Can Satan divide your church? Really? Talk to me, church. Remember what we said yesterday? Oh, you weren't here yesterday? The, the quicker you respond to me, the quicker you get lunch. Amen? <laughs> Some of you, the, your faces look like you're hungry. If Satan can divide men from God, what makes you think he can't divide you from each other? If Satan can rip out the heart of God and the angels from heaven, what makes you think you're so special? Who's good at fighting? Anybody here good at fighting? Because you look like you're getting bored. Who's good at fighting? Anybody? Anybody good at fighting? Nobody likes fighting. Yeah, just come to the front. Who's good at fighting? <laughs> just want to show you something about unity and fighting. I'm just a fat, bald Greek man. Don't be scared. Why am I clapping? Who am I clapping? <laughs> Are you coming? Shall I come and get him? Yeah, show him. just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Where is he? Who, who am I po Who are you pointing to? This buddy here? God bless you, man. God bless you. Amen. Okay, who else is good at fighting? John? Who's John? Where's John? This man here? Okay, John, come forward for me. Come. Just up, up here. Okay. And I need, uh, I need, uh, yeah, you, you, you look young, trim, fit. Yeah, okay. So you just wait here for me. You just wait here for me. You just wait here for me. So um, let me take you because you look like you're easier than him. Okay. Okay, you just stand there. So... This is me, I'm a Christian. What's your name, John? John? This is John. He's not a Christian. Not in real life, I don't know. I'm just, it's just an illustration, don't hurt me. Okay, you try not to hurt me. Okay, so, so John and I, so, so I'm trying to do the right thing in life. And I'm being attacked, so attack me, John. <laughs> attack me, John. Ah. <laughs> All right, attack me, John. Come on. <laughs> okay, so this is okay. I can deal with John. John, John, look at him. He's skinny. He's got no hair, you know. <laughs> but here's a, here's, here, that's okay. I can deal with that. I can see that coming. But what happens now, what happens now is I'm dealing with this issue here. I'm dealing with this issue here. Come on. Right? So, go, yeah? Okay. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, what, what are you doing? Come on. So I'm, I'm dealing with this issue here. Ah, ah, ah. 
So what's the problem now? Okay, so what should I do? You're a good fighter. What would you do if you got more than one enemy? Here's what you do. Why am I standing in a corner? I've now locked off this entire area. I can see them coming both, right? But what do I do, church, what do we do when we have more than one enemy and we have no wall? What do we do, church? We become a wall for each other. And we fight together. Because we're united and we support each other. And as these are strong men, I just want you to stay here for a second because I, I really want to bring this through. Can I have some more strong people, please? You can be a woman, by the way. <laughs> Any strong men, women? Just come forward quickly because you're hungry and I want you to get food. You look like you're about to pass out. Anybody? Strong people? Yeah? Amen. Hey, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, and just line up uh, uh, across. There. Any more? I need uh, maybe two more. Really strong people. Are you really strong? Gavin. Gavin. Gavin? Where's Gavin? Gavin's yeah, just there. Just there with the checkered the shirt. Check shirt. Where's the gentleman who was shouting really loudly yesterday? Owen, come on, buddy. I want Owen at the front. All right, so if you could just form a line facing this way, please. Just form a, And the strongest of you should be at the front and the weakest should be at the back. The front? The, the, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, are you going to stay at the front? Yeah, you might be strong for me. Okay, yeah. I love your enthusiasm, but you don't know what we're going to do yet, do you? Okay. And then, yeah. So right at the front, right at the front. And so just step it back a bit and put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. You want to be there? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay, step it right back because I need to squeeze in here. In fact, you know what? <laughs> okay. So put your hands on my shoulders. All right, so everybody, you're in a straight line. You know what I'm going to do here, church? I'm going to ask them to push. Okay, on the count of three, I'm going to ask them to push. Do you think I can hold them off? Yes. Do you want to be there? Yep. You should. You okay there? They're going to push forward, crush, destroy. Okay. She's part of it. Your heels ain't. Well, okay. Um, do you have any first aiders here? Okay. Yeah, good. Are you all insured? You have life insurance? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Sorry? Okay. I like her. She's got. Do you think I can do this? Do you think he can do it? Okay, I'm going to let him do it. Put your hands against the wall. <laughs> Lock your arms. Lock your arms. Okay? So on the count of three, you need to have enough room to lock your arms. So just step it back, okay? And you need to kind of form a straight line, otherwise you'll buckle. All right, so right up against the wall. John, just move closer to the wall. All right, so you guys, flex your arms. <laughs> You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Are you okay? Yep. You comfortable with this? Are your parents here? No. Okay, excellent. Okay, 1CXX967, could you move your car now, please? 1CXX967, you're about to get a ticket. Lock your arms. Church, do you believe this young man can hold off these one, one and a half, two, two, three, four, five, six? Do you think that this one person could... I mean, look at this guy. He's ripped. Huh? John, you look like that guy in that movie. What's the guy's name? The English guy, not Rambo, the English guy. <laughs> Locks, anyway, I, I don't watch those, I don't, I don't watch those movies. Right, on the count of three. Are you okay, you're feeling brave? Yep. Yeah? yeah? You don't seem too confident. <laughs> on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> okay, okay, okay.
Right. <clears throat> I ain't being sexist. It's just a fact, okay? <laughs> Okay, right, guys, I really want you to give it, yeah? <laughs> I have no idea if it didn't look good. Go! <laughs> give them a round of applause. Well done. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, buddy. What just happened? How is one guy holding off all of these strong, well, mainly strong, people? <laughs> How is he doing that? And here's the beautiful thing about this. Here's the beautiful thing about this. This guy at the front, how many people is he holding off? Why? Why is he only holding off one person? Because actually, the person behind him is absorbing all of the pressure of the guy behind him. And when you get to all the way down, everybody's absorbing everybody's pressure. And the lady at the back, well, no worries there, but... <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to do as a church. We're supposed to absorb the pressure for each other. When one person hurts, everybody hurts. When one part of your body is unwell, it's all unwell. When one person is hungry, you're all hungry because you're not taking care of each other. I'm going to guess and say there's about 200, maybe 250 people here today. And in most churches this size, I guarantee you, there will be five people that nobody ever speaks to. Nobody ever invites home. Nobody ever gets a phone call. I'm not guessing. I know this. I've done this long enough to know that sometimes we don't take care of each other. And sometimes church really hurts. And people outside need to come in knowing that they're going to find warmth. Christ said that a kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. If a church is torn in many directions, then Christians become bitter and grudges are nurtured. Isolation abounds into separate factions and the principles of forgiveness is denied. But there is something far worse than all of this, my friends. If a church has no love, then the very heart of God is broken. And if you're able to break the heart of God, you are a dying church. Not North. Amen? Are you a dying church? Sure? Yeah? 100%? Can, can we do a little test? Oh, oh, oh. Went quiet there. Let me just show you some of the signs of a dying church. Amen? Some of the signs of a dying church. When the baptismal pool sits idle month after month after month after month. Still alive? There's the phone. <laughs> Signs of a dying church is when the only amen heard is the one after the benediction and the one before grace. Signs of a dying church is when qualification for leadership positions is determined by a person's education or wealth. While those whom God has called are ignored because they lack both the education and the wealth. Signs of a dying church is when evangelism means watching somebody else do it on the God channel. When maintaining tradition becomes the number one priority at the expense of losing young people from the church because we have always done it this way. You know, um, um, Dave shared with me um, something quite interesting and I, I, I researched this a little bit more. It's called the monkey, banana, and water spray experiment. And there are three stages to this experiment. And it involved five original monkeys and five subsequently all new monkeys in a cage with a banana and a ladder and an ice-cold water hose. And the experiment went like this. Five monkeys are locked in a cage. There's a banana hanging from the ceiling, and a ladder is placed right underneath the, the, the banana. And guess what happens? Sure enough, one of the monkeys goes to... One of the monkeys goes to get, it's okay, let the baby cry. It's cool. It's cool. 
one of the monkeys goes up to get a banana. And, and, and as, soon as, as, soon as, um, as soon as the monkey goes up to get a banana, this is a real experiment, you can, you can Wikipedia this. Water, ice cold water is sprayed at the other monkeys. Or depending which version of the story you read, at all the monkeys. So, so the monkey gets off the ladder, doesn't want anything to do with his eyes, but he keeps going back to get the, the, the banana, keeps getting sprayed. Everyone's getting sprayed. Now it gets to the point where the, when, when the monkey starts going for, for the banana, the other monkeys start beating up on the monkey that's going up the ladder. <laughs> second monkey tries it, second monkey gets beaten up, eventually all the monkeys are getting beaten up. They stop spraying the monkeys. But none of the monkeys are now going for the banana. They take out one of the, this is part two now, they take out one of the original monkeys and they put a new monkey in. No water is sprayed. And of course the new monkey doesn't know what's going on. So the monkey says, there's a banana, I'm a monkey. I'm going to climb up the ladder and get this banana. As soon as he makes a move for the ladder, guess what happens? The other four monkeys start pounding. <coughs> so the new monkey's like, what's going on with these guys? The other monkey has not been sprayed. He does not know why he's not allowed to go for the banana. Then they take out another of the original monkeys and they replace him with a second monkey. And as soon as the second monkey, I'm a, I'm a banana, I'm a monkey, there's a banana, the second monkey goes for the banana and the first new monkey starts beating up on the second monkey. The first monkey doesn't know why he's beating up the second monkey. <laughs> he's just beating him up. And the second monkey's like, what's wrong with you? We're monkeys, banana monkeys. And eventually they go through this and they've replaced all of the original monkeys with new monkeys. And they all have been beaten up. And there is a banana hanging from the ceiling and a ladder to the banana. And none of the monkeys are going for the banana. And nobody knows why. And if I could have interviewed those monkeys and said to them, why have you not gone for the banana? They would say to me, I don't know. That's just the way we do things around here. Are you with me? They tried to get younger people to go to Sabbath school. So what they, what they thought was, well, let's have Sabbath school after divine worship. Sounds like a pretty cool idea. Attendance went through the roof. But then somebody said, no, we can't do this. Why not? Because that's not how we do things around here. Why not? I don't know. We've got to be paid. <laughs> Crazy, craziness, craziness says that if you do everything the same way, you'll get a different result. If you want something different, you have to be prepared to do something different. Are you prepared to evangelize? Are you, are you prepared to be a church of unity? The other signs of, of a dying church is when the church is only open for 43 hours a month when they should be open for 720 hours. I mean, that's really for you to sort out, but I've never understood, I never understood why churches close. Hospitals don't close. Signs of a dying church is when more people are present for board meeting than prayer meeting. How's that? 
Signs of a dying church is when more church money is spent on flowers and on evangelism, when money becomes the number one priority, when most people arrive late and complain if the sermon goes on too long, when leaders are selected based on the family you belong to or the loudness of your voice, when a decision is based on what you say rather than whether it's right or wrong, when everybody complains on what's wrong but nobody wants to give you a solution, when everybody tells you what to do but not how to do it, where everybody acts like they're perfect and holier than thou, when people take credit for the work of others. These are the signs of of a church that is either at a plateau or declining. Like the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I know you're inside and out and find little to my liking. I don't know why the monkeys keep coming back. I wish that you were hot or cold. Far better to either be cold or hot because you're still, you're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. You brag I'm rich. I've got it made. I need from nobody, oblivious to the fact that you're pitiful, blind, beggar, threadbare, and homeless. The solution to such problems, my friend, be diligent. Turn from indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock, and if you hear me calling and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal as friends. Could this be your church? 5% of the reported church members don't exist. 10% cannot be found. 20% seldom prays. 30% never attends church regularly. 40% never contributes to any cause. 60% doesn't attend Sabbath school. Hello, somebody. 70% doesn't engage in any church activity. 80% never attends prayer meeting. 90% doesn't have family worship. 95% has never won a soul for Christ. North Perth Church. Are you a dying church? And God is asking each and every one of us here today, why will we die? But if we are brave enough to go down this process and go down this road and recognize that the cessation of life is there, rigor mortis may not have yet been in full effect, but, but we need to recognize the symptoms. And if we are recognize the symptoms and we say that this might be us, I want to show you how to resurrect the dead, my friends. Number one, you need to recognize that death has occurred. You're going to get nowhere by saying you're alive when you're really dead. And I'm asking you to humor me now because I know this isn't your church. But it's like the alcoholic who says, I have no problem. At the age of 16, 17, I was downing two bottles of vodka neat. But I did not have a problem. I learned from my father, who still today does not have a problem. God bless him, I love him. But after numerous heart attacks and angina attacks and doctors saying, if you drink one more drink, you're going to die. He still says, "Ah, it's okay, I'm doing it in moderation. We have to recognize what's going on in our lives. And I want you to know, it is possible for you to be physically alive and yet spiritually dead. Paul says that when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. Paul goes on to say, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. And then finally he says, she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's only one thing wrong with many people in this world today. They're dead. No dead people here. But in the world, it's not unusual to see dead people laughing and crying and eating and drinking. I tell you this much, it's not even that strange today to hear dead people preaching. Number two, perform the autopsy. How did it die? What caused it to die? When did it die? Where did it die? How did it die? Number three, we need to be open with the results. You see, it's only when we recognize the situation that we can go out and get some help. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, North Perth Church, if we say we have no sin, then we are liars. And the truth is not in us. We deceive ourselves. But if we're prepared to get real with our situation, God can start to work with us towards recovery. And just for the record, you can hide from people, but you cannot hide from God. Does anybody have any scary texts? Do you know what I'm talking about when I say a scary text? It's one that causes you discomfort. Anybody got any scary texts? 
scary Bible text? Nobody has any scary Bible text. Can I share with you my scary Bible text? It's this one here. What you have said in the dark. <laughs> you know the things you say about each other that you, you know, you know um, I'm, I'm not feeling too well today, so I had to quickly run to the bathroom. That's why I wasn't here for the main prayer. And I said, I said to, um, uh, yeah, yeah, what is it? Yemi, Yemiko. I said to him, pray long. <laughs> and I've got to run to the bathroom. And I recognized I had the microphone with me. <laughs> Amen. So I had to make sure it was off. Amen. Just in case. I didn't want you guys to hear what was going on. And imagine now I went outside and, 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 and you know, somebody said to me, you know, you know the, the chief finance officer is here. You know, and he, he, he doesn't like me. I asked him for some money and he said, no, that old now, he wouldn't want him to hear that. But the Bible says that everything that is said in the darkness will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed from the roots. God knows everything that you say. God knows everything that you do. And just because I can't hear it, or just because you can't hear it, doesn't make it right for me to do it. And it's only when we are open with the results. It's only when, 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 when we are able to be uh, honest with, with each other. I don't really mind how you feel about me, but come and tell me. Because if I have a problem, then maybe I can address it. But how are you going to help me if all you're doing is talking about me? Number four. Actually, before I do that, um, does anybody... Um, I know, I know you all, none of you listen to secular music, but, but um, there's an old song, and, and some, somebody here, I can't remember who it was, uh, he was sitting over there last night, he's a, he's a bit of an old rocker, um, and there's a song, there's a song called um, If Walls Could Talk, do, do, does anybody know that song? If Walls Could uh, let me, let, me sh let me share with you the words. This is a secular song, but listen to the, listen to the message. It says, can you imagine if you're, sorry, if, if, if can you imagine if your shoes could talk? To say where they've been when you said you were visiting a friend. And the song says, ain't you glad, ain't you glad that shoes can't talk? Can you imagine if doors could tell who turned the knob when he says he's out on a job? Can you imagine if cars could tell who's been inside and who's been taking you out for a ride? Ain't you glad, oh, ain't you glad? that cars don't talk. In a world of trouble, I would be if things ever told on me. My whole life will be through because I'm guilty. How about you? If things ever talk that way, ain't no telling what they might say. Ain't you glad or ain't you glad that things don't talk? And what if walls could talk? What if your internet connection could talk? What if your web browser could talk? What if your favorite social network website could talk? What if your bed sheets could talk? What if your wine glasses could talk? What if your family planning clinics could talk? What if your bars and your clubs could talk? What if your vestries could talk? What if your pulpits could talk? Number four, you need to allow others to examine the evidence. Stop trying to hide. Sometimes we need other people to come and help us. You need to send for Jesus. You need a specialist. Some of us need emotional surgery so bad we need Jesus in neurologist. Pray to the Father before the Son had ever risen and long into the night. Jesus was there praying to the Father. I'm crazy enough to believe that if Jesus prayed to the Father, why aren't we? You need to pray for the Holy Ghost because the Bible says in the book of Acts that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Create an atmosphere for change. Engage in the whole church, my brothers and my sisters. You know, you know some of us think we're so smart and there's nothing anybody else can teach us. Listen, there's nobody so smart that, that you cannot learn from each other. I can always teach somebody something and somebody can always teach something. To, but you know, some of us are unteachable. What do you know? You can't tell me anything. Look how handsome I am. How ugly. Look at the car you drive. You have no hair. Hmm. We need to commit to change. We need to commit to the commitment. When we say we're going to evangelize, we don't mean go to the followhim.org.au website. 
we mean share your love. Share your life. Feeding is good, but not just feeding food. Clothing people is good, but not just clothing nakedness, but clothing people who need robes of righteousness. We need to implement our change, forgetting those things which were behind, but reaching forth. God is calling us to the prize of the, 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 the high calling of God, the, the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. God is calling us to something bigger and special. And we need to commit to the commitment. We need to rediscover our, our, our purpose and our mission. And we talked about this yesterday. We've, we've lost what we were really about. And finally, my friends, my final exercise for you today, could everybody just take in a, a deep breath, the deepest breath you have, and just hold it for me. Come on, take it all in. I hope you'll brush your teeth this morning. Take it all in. The Greek word for forgive means to exhale. Hold it, hold it, hold it. It means to exhale. If you do have asthma or anything like that, please don't do this. <clears throat> the Greek word for forgive means to exhale, to release it, because you're taking in oxygen and you're releasing carbon dioxide. And if you don't release the carbon dioxide, guess what happens? You die. The Greek for forgive means to exhale because if you don't exhale, you die. If you don't forgive, you die. Have any of you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. And forgive us our debt as we. You see the two are linked. You're actually saying to God, if I don't forgive, don't forgive me. You die. Anybody here got any unforgiveness going on? Hmm? Somebody on the other side maybe, because you don't want to be near them. We need to learn how to get along, guys. We need to learn to how to get along. And you know when you don't forgive him? Anybody been hurt before? Don't, don't raise your hand. Let's pretend. Let's pretend you've been hurt. I mean, let's pretend I hurt you. No, not me. Let's pretend the chief finance officer hurt you. I don't mean financially. I mean you were in something and he hurt you. You used to go to church with him, but he hurt you one day. Whatever reason it was. But the classic one is going to be the hurt of the heart. He betrayed you. She betrayed you. It doesn't have to be male or female. And, and you hate him so much. You can't go a day without feeling the hurt and wanting to be free of the pain. And you can't move on. It's been years now. You can't let it go. He moved on. He got married. He got children. He's living in Barbados. He bought a condo. He, he's got a great job, great money, carpet, cars. He doesn't even remember your name. Somebody say, Ish. And his Zimbo's here. Hey! Sorry, that's a Zimbabwean thing. And what you have done is, you know what a surgical needle is? You know, you know those curved ones like a crescent? What you've done is you've hooked it in yourself and you've brought it out the other side and you've hooked him in with you and the very thing that you need to be free of, you're permanently attached to yourself. Forgiveness is a massive thing. That's why I'm laboring this point. And you will never move on until you allow Christ to heal you. That's why we talked about who validates you last night. Because you're kind of stuck in this place, not able to move on. You're stuck where you are. We need to go back to the concept of love because when you have love, you have Christ. And when you have Christ, he will set you free. For only Christ, so who sets, Christ, only Christ can set you free. Only Christ can set you free. He says, if you forgive others, then your Father will forgive you. But if you... God cannot forgive you if you're not prepared to forgive. 
I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up because I'm, I'm, I've, I've been going on too long, but I'm going to bring this to an end. But I, wa- I, want, you, I want you to get something today. I want you to get something. What God is trying to say to us with, with this unity thing, yeah? He said, you cannot, you cannot sit on the fence where Christianity is concerned. Honestly and truly, you can't. I've tried it. I've tried it. It's very uncomfortable sitting on the fence, especially as a, a guy. You know, it's, it's, you, you, you see stuff going on. You want to you wanna be involved in both camps. You can't do that. You cannot do that. Make a decision. Be hot or be cold. But don't be lukewarm. God says he, he, he will spew you out. He will spit you out. If you're not for God, you're against him. There's no middle ground. And too many of us are trying to hold some kind of middle ground. Well, I like the idea of church. I like the idea of heaven. Maybe if I go to church, I'll get there. No. It doesn't work like that, my brothers and my sisters. He says, no servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one or love the other. You can't do both. You can't do both. You can't, you can't say you're a Christian and then live this double standard life, guys. And finally... Different, since God has loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I want you just to contemplate on this final video as we end this message. Six humans trapped by happenstance in bleak and bitter cold. Each possessed a stick of wood, or so the stories told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first man held his back. For of the faces round the fire, he noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give the fire his stick of birch. The third one sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight. For all he saw in a stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this fallen group did naught except for gain. Giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. Their logs held tight in death's still hand was proof of human sin. They did not die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. Father, I pray that they will be completely one as we are one. And this quote from John Wesley says, I want the whole Christ for my Savior, the whole Bible for my book, the whole church for my fellowship, and the whole world for my mission field. Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I want us all to stand, please, as we close in prayer. And as we do this, I want you to think about yourself in this word. And I want you to commit to either being an evangelist, 
And by being an evangelist, you don't have to go far and wide. You're making a commitment to share the word of God. And I want you to come back at 3 o'clock. In fact, you don't need to leave because there's lunch. But I want you to be back at 3 o'clock because I want you to really engage in this process. I want us all to come together and really focus on how we're going to make a difference. We're not having an appeal now because I want to make sure that there's enough time for us to be able to get back because this is the most important thing in life. I'm going to show you scriptures which says that if you will not tell them, then who? And that's Jesus speaking. It's Paul speaking. It's the disciples speaking. If we don't go, then who will go? Do you know that 80% of you came to church before you had ever heard a sermon? Because somebody else shared the gospel with you. 80%. And the final statistic I'll leave you with is this. Jesus had 136 conversations in the New Testament. Four of them were in the temple. Two of them were in the synagogue. 130 of them were in the community. As we pray, pray in your own heart that you'll make a commitment to being a, a Christian. That you make a commitment to unity. That you make a commitment, as we did last night, to intimacy with God. Spending time with the Lord. Strengthening yourselves. There's something far more important than your family. And that's sharing with others the life that God gave us. And if we're alive in Christ, we would instinctively want to make other people alive in Christ as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Some of us will not have been impressed by this message, but I know that the Holy Spirit will have touched the lives and hearts of so many here today to want to do more for you, to commit to unity, to not allowing our churches to die as so many others have. There was once fire in so many churches, but now, Lord, there's hardly even a spark. But Lord, there's a song that says it only takes a spark to get the fire going. Help us, Father, that we may not be sitting on the fence anymore, but that we may commit to change. That we may recognize our true condition, Lord. That we are hot, that we are cold, or that even that we are lukewarm, but that we would do something about our lukewarmness. And if, Father... We happen to be talking about North Perth Church or any other church represented here today. Then may the change begin here. May the change begin with me. And may it spread like a fire, Lord. Please bless this church. Please bless every single person in this building. Whether they belong to church or not, please help them to find the peace that passes all understanding. But Father, help us to recognize how good and how peaceful it is when we come together in unity. We thank you for everything now, Lord. Thank you for the ministers of this church. Thank you for the evangelists in this church. Thank you for those who are prepared to smile with somebody, to listen to somebody, to lend an ear, to even help mend a broken heart. Help us to forgive. Help us to share. Help us to heal. And we ask all of these things through the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let the church of God say amen. Amen, amen and amen. Just turn to somebody next to you. Please encourage them. Give them a hug. Give them a kiss. Ask them if there's anything that they need in Jesus' name.